Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to our latest uh, webinar. The bells are ringing, so must be uh, must be good one o'clock. Yeah, maybe a marriage, something like that. Possibly, possibly marriage. So, welcome. This is the uh, the project manager in the NEC for ETC webinar, and we're trying to look at what is new <coughs> and, uh, and and what is uh, what is different. So, if I can introduce um, to my right, to your left, as you see it. But anyway. Over to my right, Richard Passon, who's uh, an NEC drafter of Mark McDonald and a good friend of mine. Good afternoon. And I'm Rob Gerard, the NEC Users Group Secretary, also NEC4 drafter for whatever that means. So the focus is on the NEC4 engineering and construction contracts, in particular the project manager, the role of the project manager, and we're trying to tease out really uh, what is new and what is different in that role. So welcome, Richard. Good day. And over to you. Okay, so for those of you that didn't join the the first webinar, this just to be very very brief. NC three has been around for next part, best part of twelve years now, so we've got twelve years of learning gone into NC four. I think you'll see there's significant evolution, but it's not a revolution. It's nothing radical. It's just better, and it has improved. Um, it, there would be no logic to me in starting off on a new contract with NC three. There's been lots of effort gone into NC4. So you think it would quite quickly be, um, not, quite, not quite defunct or out of date, but people will switch automatically? Or I see no reason not to, apart from the fact that, as you know, a lot of clients are already on frameworks, they've got stuff yeah. ready. Um, that There's probably a lot of lawyers around the country trying to sort out a quick addenda to switch from three to four. That'll be fairly radical, but it's possible. Um, okay. So. The, Sorry, one thing I found in my duty, didn't I, to say, um, uh, on your screen you should have um, some uh, the ability to ask questions. So if at any time there's a question in you, at the moment we have 790, oh, 800, sorry, going up all the time, 802 people attending this webinar. If you have a question in you, then please do uh, ask it. We'll do our best to answer them as we go through the webinar, but those we can't, we'll answer um, Separately, if all of you ask a question, we'll probably spend the rest of our working lives answering <laughs> them, to ask them, yeah. but we'll, we'll do our best. Okay, we'll, sorry. We'll try. Okay, so the, the, the thread for today, there's a couple of quick slides on some of the new and changed secondary options in the ECC4. There's a, a one slide and a few bits on specifically on the language changes, and then radically, I thought I'd use the structure of one to nine brilliant idea um, to tease out some of the key things. So I've got a copy of my still draft NEC4 highlighted with the things that I thought were worth talking about on this session. So that's where we're going. Um, and right. So new and change options. Firstly, in response to requests and to be honest, to make the, I think, largely to make the contract more um, usable and the dispute avoidance board concept has generally been used a lot more internationally. I do a lot of work with World Bank and Asian Development Bank contracts where the dispute avoidance board has been standard for 10 years. So NEC is really catching up by making that as a, an option. This is where we have one or three uh, specialists, hopefully experts in the type of work we're doing. Difference being they're not deciding the dispute, they're there for reference and to have a chat really to avoid the dispute and there's a routine meeting for them to come in at a stated period within the in the contract data. So the clue's in the word avoidance isn't it? They're, the clue, they're yeah. not, it's not a DRB, it's not a resolution board, it's an avoidance board. It's an avoidance they're, board. They're, they're as constructively and helpfully as they can guiding the parties away from formal disputes. Absolutely and the effect on the project manager really is just that that dispute feeling perhaps will be a little bit closer, so there'll be a routine requirement to present to a dispute of audience board on where things are going. Okay. Again, got to be careful, we haven't got time for too much detail on these, so we'll, okay. we'll try and skip through. It's about how it affects the project manager. Yeah. Like, like anything, so something the project manager does or doesn't do, if you're not careful, could quickly come in front of the DAB Indeed. to, to uh, suggest a way forward. So it's a, quite a And, and it's a, that's a good point, point Rob, because it's a regular DAB. When, we, when adjudication first yeah. came out, of course the idea was that there was going to be adjudications, you know, short and sharp, quick, but that's that's changed. Sorry, moving on. W1 and W2, they stay as they were, except there's the addition of a first stage where the, the parties can go off to named senior representatives 
prior to going off to the adjudicator. Now, as most of you will know, with W2, we have to allow a dispute to adjudication at any time under the Housing Grants Act. And in this case, in W2, the reference to senior re representatives has to be by agreement between the parties. And how does that affect the project manager, do you think? <laughs> does it affect them massively? Not really, except that they, I guess the project manager will find themselves having to be able to coherently present the situation to those senior reps, perhaps in a, an environment which isn't quite as adversarial at this stage as it would be, intimidating as, as it would be in uh, the adjudication. Okay, but again, the project manager, come to the project manager, will seek to avoid if at all possible. Uh, of course. Anything going anywhere near senior yeah, representatives. Rob, Rob and yeah. I have been, have been training for 20 years on this stuff and the whole of NEC is a dispute avoidance process in its own right. Yeah. Okay, the next two are cunningly coloured in orange to hint those of you in the know that they've probably come across from a professional services contract, which has an, or has an orange, you've missed that, Rob, come on, which has an orange cover. So we have what's now called undertakings to the client and others, which is collateral warranties, which has always been lurking in the PSC, but many clients have wanted it in a construction contract, and therefore we've in, it's been included now as an option. Same as the case with PSC, NEC is not in the business of trying to draft the warranties themselves, we're just giving the process and the requirement to provide warranties as required by the contract. Okay. Lastly, X9 is a transfer of rights clause to do with intellectual property, which again has been transferred pretty much across, I believe, from PSC. Okay, for a little interaction from the project manager here perhaps may, maybe assist the employer maybe assist the PM the process to, of these to make it happen happening, or but there's no direct obligation no, on the PM to accept 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 okay. again swiftly because there's quite a lot here to cover Rob as we talked about before um, a parent company guarantee becomes an ultimate holding company guarantee and there's a little bit difference in the drafting but no real day-to-day -day effect jumping ahead termination by client very little day-to-day -day effect one hopes and contractor's design is a significant one where X15, X15 used to just cover due skill and care. Now it's been wrapped together with things that really are going to be needed if there is any contractor's design, certainly any significant contractor's design. There's a, a prompt for professional indemnity insurance, which wasn't in an EC3. Yeah. There's clarity on intellectual property and licensing to use, which fills one of the criticisms of NEC that it wasn't good, perhaps. Some people yeah. have said uh, intellectual property. It also reverses the burden of proof, doesn't that's it? That's one good point. Uh, it does. And that's that's a, a detail, but I guess it's not going to affect the day-to-day -day roles. But no. well, again, in, a, in an hour's webinar, you people out there, we can't get into the details. This is just the, the headlines, really. Um, X21 is whole life cost, which is a simple clause under which the contractor can say, hey, if we just tweak that, that might reduce the OPEX, operational expenditure, which might be a good idea, Mr. Client, overall. And then there's just a mechanism within the contract to do a deal in the same way there is an acceleration. We'll do a deal on scope coming later, prices and completion date. Yeah, there is no Mr. Client, of course. It's there is no, oh, sorry, yes, oh yes, we are. Rob and I have been joking about this this afternoon. Um, the NEC, we have made significant effort in yeah. undoing what should have been done 10 years ago, some would say, that it will make Rob and I's job in training a lot easier because we don't have a masculine project manager anymore. Quite so right. I, think, I think that's actually a very positive move. Quite right. um, two big ones. Firstly, X22 is the ECI, sorry for the acronym, Early Contractor Involvement, which has been out there on the NEC's books and on the website for at least a year, maybe yeah. more now. So it's formally brought in. There's even a formal training course that NEC will offer on that clause. Um, that will affect the project manager in a big way because that basically is a complete change in the whole procurement regime because then the project manager in that stage one is part of the team building a contract for stage two. So it's a very different role for a project manager. Um, and the only one on there I haven't mentioned is information modeling. Now it's intentionally not been called BIM, building information modeling, because there's lots of chat in the industry that has a stupid name for it anyway, because it's not just buildings that we're modeling. So we've called it information modeling, and there are detailed processes. All I put on the slide there are the defined terms. There is a requirement to contribute to an information model, model as well as the works, sorry, what's now the scope coming later, 
there's a requirement to, for the employment to give the information model requirements. What's the constraints on how this model is built up or otherwise? And then there's a requirement for the, the supplier, the contractor in this case, to develop and maintain what's called the information execution plan. So again, not enough time to do that in detail. And to be honest, neither Rob or I have really got detailed head around that. That's, that's going to take some time as we go forward in NEC4. Okay, but the project manager will play a role in that in accepting? A project manager, the exactly. Plans. The project manager will be accepting the routinely updated information execution plan. And the project manager, when he comes to accepting designs, will also be needing to be, be comfortable that those submissions comply with not only the, the normal, what we used to call the works information, but also the information model requirements. Okay. So heads up on those only. Language. Few, I think, very good things on the language. 10.1, there's already been a question on 10.1. There's no change to the real meaning of 10.1. It's just it's been split into two sentences. Shall act as stated, and then 10.2 says spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. So no real difference, to be quite honest. Um, interestingly, it's still cooperation. I don't know why we didn't change it to collaboration, but that's another story. Um, X12 in training courses, I've always been telling people that partnering was a stupid title. It was yeah. a stupid title. It's really multi-party partnering. It's been rebranded as multi-party collaboration, but the clause itself is unchanged. Wonderful, I can hear you cheering. The risk register is dead. Long live the early warning register. Okay, again in training we spend hours trying to make people understand the difference between a risk register and a project risk register because it confuses the out of people. That's much more straightforward now. We have an early warning register. Richard doesn't sleep by the way and he is seeking therapy for a number of issues. <laughs> Thank you Rob. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, I'm not quite sure which option that comes under. Okay, scope. Um, what we haven't mentioned yet is a general attempt in the updating from three to four to try to make things the same if there's no good reason for them to be different across the different contracts, particularly the ECC, the engineering construction contract, the professional services contract, and the term services contract. And one change that you'll be surprised by perhaps is that works information is dead. It's now going to be called scope. Okay. So, but in terms of everything else, it's not a change. It was literally, really affect the project. It doesn't affect the project. So just, just new terminology. But to you're going to have to get, you get used to get used to Change language. of forms, you know, change yeah, the language. Those, those sort of things. Nothing more than that. Yeah. Um, in a similar vein, across the patch now, we don't talk about an employer. We talk about the client. And more of a detailed one, um, there's been lots of criticism over the last 10 years about the whole of section eight, and there's been some tidying up there, but the main thing or a language thing is that what we used to call an employer's risk is now more usefully called the client's liability to emphasize the difference because of the indemnities that it involves if the employer chooses to have those yeah. clients liability. Okay. So two, two, um, two changes. Interesting. The word risk has disappeared in two, two places. As yeah. such. It is quite difficult training, isn't it? Where you, using risk in different sentences, in different in processes, in different, ways. different things, yeah. where really the intention of the drafters was not really the word risk in that case. So I think that's a good thing, liability. but again, I say there have been some, some tweaks to the wording of section eight, but the fundamental essence is unchanged by anything on this slide. It's just a language issue. Would you okay. agree, Rob? Yeah, yeah, I would agree, I would agree. Uh, pause to um, one question, has the role of the supervisor changed in NEC4? Um, effectively very, very little, if at all. Yes. So I think the supervisor's role is pretty much unchanged, except that, as we'll see in a moment, there is an additional requirement in terms of a quality management system, which mm. we'll pick up on the slides coming up very shortly. But simple answer, supervisor will still be the supervisor. Yeah, no ish is the answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thanks. So core clauses, like I said, I thought I'd be radical and set them out in one to nine except that seven to nine are too dull, so we'll make do with one to six. Okay. Um, I'm just giving a joke. Can you say that again? No, 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 that's fine. Everybody I got that. that was quite cool. Everybody got that. Move on, sorry. Um, so general, um, firstly, we have an explicit prompt in the conditions for the scope, if you want to, 
to specify the required communication system. This is just reflecting good practice really. All it does is, the only change is that we'll, when somebody's kind of confronted with the job of preparing a scope, there'll be a clear prompt to decide whether or not to specify the communication system. That communication system could be pen and paper, more likely these days as we move into more contracts using the in the cloud management systems. Okay, so so there's many and quite excellent examples of that. So again, it's for the project manager to make sure that they follow whatever the communication system is specified. In yeah, again, like I say, it's not actually changing anything. It's just making a clear prompt when it comes to yeah. writing the scope. Good people writing the scope, the works information, be doing it anyway. It's not, yeah. it's not difficult. It's just catching up. Likewise, on any job I've ever been involved in, it's pretty obvious that the project managers are going to set up the risk register for the first risk reduction meeting. But yeah. it never said that in the contract. Okay. It does now. Likewise, except it's the early warning register. Except it's the early warning, thanks, early warning meeting. Yeah. And it's okay. an early warning meeting. Um, likewise, good practice has been established and for years. Most well-run NEC contracts will have a routine risk reduction meeting and not rely on waiting for one party to instruct the other to come along. All, all we've done in the contract this time is to have that as a, a period stated in the contract data. So as, a, so as an obligation to hold that meeting no longer than. To be honest, there's no remedy in the contract if it doesn't get held, but it's just, again, setting out good practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I still see problems in the areas of early warnings. I still see uncertainty, reluctance, a fear factor. Heaven knows why, but you know. That's, that's Again, that, that, that hasn't changed. And I know Rob, for the last five years, has been telling us we shouldn't use the word warning because we should have positive things in early warning meetings yeah. anyway. Threats, Again, let's not, some opportunities, but anyway. let's not try and change everything. Let's just. No. Well, Rob, you were the one that told me I had to stick to the you. script. Okay, sorry. Come on. Um, there's now a very clear chain, a clause for the contractor to submit proposals to change what he's been asked to provide. It. In the sorry, for the contractor to submit proposals in the client scope to change what's been in the yeah. client scope. Yeah. Remember, client scope is what we used to call works information. Um, in the case of the target contracts, that's it. There's no great change because in 63 something, I can't remember. I'm not that sad. There's a clause which we've always called the value engineering clause, which says that if we agree a change to that document, the prices are not reduced, and therefore the contractor gets a benefit in accordance with the share mechanism. Yeah. What was missing in NEC3, and we had to patch back in if you wanted it, was the same principle in options A and B. Because under A and B in NEC3, if the contractor says, hey, we can save a million there, the employer says, oh, great idea changes the works information and Perhaps bring, brings the price down by a million. Yeah. So there's no incentive for the contractor to, to suggest that. Now, when you prepare the document, you'll have to think about it and you'll have to plug into the contract data of so-called value engineering percentage, which is going to be the percentage that the contractor takes for his good ideas. It's, so, it's going to be, but um, so it's for the project manager to administer the, the project percentage, manager which will which is fixed in the contract data part two. Indeed. And yeah. the price is the valuation of proposals is done in the same way as a compensation. It's done on a defined cost, cost fee, I'm pretty sure. I shouldn't have said that right. I'm supposed to know this one. So anyway, yes, moving on. So that's, that's to me, is, as all those changes are very positive. They're all relatively simple, um, but they're all going in the right direction. Section two, Rob suggested we just deleted the slide, but I just wanted it to go to two. There is no real significant difference in the whole subcontractor process. There's some changes to the language and details, but it's nothing, I think nothing worth shattering. The one thing that has been done, and will be interesting actually, is some changes to the definition of subcontractor itself. Um, but again, I think that's possibly a bit too much detail for today. Uh, the, there is something in, in subcontracting about um, the actual terms and conditions used in the subcontracts have to basically uh, Match if that's the right that's word. To match. That so, 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 so there, there yeah. is a process that the project manager needs to be aware of. Yeah. In and, and not accepting the subcontracts. And, and there documents. are subtle things like like in NEC three, there was an obligation under the target contract to submit the contract data for the subcontracts. Yeah. Which of course was completely meaningless if, if the subcontracts were were not using NEC. Yeah. So it's price. So now it asks for the pricing information, for example. Yeah. Like I say, detail. If you're a project manager and you're coming to NEC four then guess what? You're going to have to yeah. read the contract. So there are going to be changes. 
look out for Robbie's coming book on the changes to highlight those changes. It's going to be um, brilliant. It's going to be it's going to be a storm. I'm, I've heard it's brilliant. Um, but in reality, these these are details. They're not, there's nothing yeah. to, to just no, no great shows. In contrast, time number three, you recognise as time, or you any see uh, people out there. And so, firstly, again, a prompt for the person writing the scope to say in what form they want to see the programme. So the form is a what? Like a well, Gantt so, chart so or... typically, well, I think the gap, the requirement for a Gantt chart is inherent in thirty one two itself, as it always yeah. is. The form here, you can't show order and timing without a Gantt chart. In my really, okay, let's not start arguing, Rob. It's not okay. a good idea. I think what this is trying to say. Line of balance. You seen one of those? I have. Okay. All right. God. What is he like? Most projects, the entry okay. in the scope here will be say, give me the, give me all elements of the program in their native software and in a PDF so that the numpties can read it, and on a bit of paper so I can stick it on the wall. It's that sort of form I think we're talking about here. It could be more. It, again, with all NEC things, it's an open statement. Whatever you write in the scope becomes an obligation on the yeah. contractor yeah. to do. Um, this is a big one. If we have no submitted program within the two, sorry, if there's no response under 31.3 to the program submitted from the by the, from the project manager, yeah. no response to that program, then similar to the way there are some prompts regarding the two stages of compensation and assessment, which was new in NC3, now the same principle has been applied to the program. So no response within the designated two weeks, contractor may, doesn't have to, contractor may prompt. If the PM is still saying nothing for another week, you know what's coming next. The program is treated as accepted. So that I think is a significant change. And in terms of what it does to the project manager, well, it's me making them realize that they might get that prod a little bit more often if they are tardy in doing what they're supposed to be doing. That, that, to me, that's not the best outcome. That's not of course what we're striving right. to achieve. What we want is the meeting of minds here between project manager and contractor yeah. to create that program, which is able yeah. to be accepted in a timely fashion, <laughs> well within the time scales. Absolutely agree, Rob. And, you know, and, and it's thoroughly, really, constantly, yeah. uh, frequently, frequently revised updated. and kept up to date. And again, in the previous slide, we just said we've now got a contractual requirement for a routine risk reduction meeting. Everybody doing NEC out there knows that there needs to be a routine meeting or sub-meeting to look at compensation events, to look at payment, and to look at program. Yeah. A well-run job will have a monthly meeting program at worst, so that pro at worst, so the program can be talked about, discussed, submitted by the contractor. PM can respond or almost by return, say yes, fine, move on. NEC is a very concise contract, and we haven't started trying to add in that level of detail. We're still leaving room for some common sense on how to do NEC properly. Yeah. So that's a significant change. So this is like a, a fallback provision almost. The, yeah. show, the show must go on. We need an accepted program in place because the cogs <laughs> of the wheel of the contract need, need that. Need program because we need that to assess compensation, compensation events and, and so on. Yeah, all sorts of things. Okay. Okay. Relatively minor tweak on acceleration. Again, if we've got to acceleration, it's bad news still, very bad news for an employer because the contractor is very definitely in control. Subtle difference now, either party can propose acceleration. Um, if that's proposed, then there's a time scale now because in the past it, any, the, the, the quotation had no time scale, which is very odd in NEC. So there's now three maximum three weeks to put together a quotation, maximum three weeks for PM to respond. Six weeks. So I always find that a bit bizarre. So you want to accelerate something, but we'll spend six, with you, but we'll spend six <laughs> weeks kicking this thing around before we press the button. Okay. As anyway. you as you well know, Rob, that period is a maximum period. Yeah. And again, I I haven't checked everything, but I, I'm pretty sure there's no express remedy in the contract if we don't respond within three weeks. But I take your point, Rob. Yeah. If we want it doing, we're going to do it we're in a hurry, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, section four I've already um, highlighted. Firstly, the whole sentence, the whole sorry, the whole part of section four has been rebranded as quality management rather than just testing and defects, a little yeah. bit more of a positive language. Yeah, that's good. Um, and essentially, this is one of these things where it was already done in PSE. Why on earth is it not in a construction contract? It's just crazy. So we now have a 
requirement for the contractor to operate a quality management system complying with the requirements as stated in the scope. And then within a certain period after um, the contract date, they've got to submit a quality policy statement for acceptance of the project manager. So obviously Rob didn't get the italics on that project manager, I apologize. For acceptance of the project manager. Um, and something's going on wrong. What are you doing, Rob? You've, okay. you've, 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 it's not going, Rob, because I don't know what you're doing. That's better. Rob was just trying to confuse me by doing some other fancy stuff on the IT. So there's also a quality policy statement, again, similar to PSC, and, and then, and lastly, a quality plan. So all of this is standard in the PSC. It's nothing radically new to the industry. And clearly, if a contractor is doing design work, you expect him to have the same systems, but also we need those systems for the, the, um, uh, for the contractor. Yeah. What is interesting here, obviously interesting only if you're a bit of an NEC person, is that the, these quality management issues here are dealt with by the project manager rather than the supervisor. Okay. Okay. All right. So just pause if I might. So I was wondering, there are no questions, but I really just have to press a button to get the latest questions. Okay. Press a button and a load of a load questions, questions coming. So okay. Okay. Let's let's just have a just a quick reflection. Will the contractor have to accelerate? Uh, no. no. You can't mandate their acceleration. No. It's a meeting of minds. Isn't uh, it? And again. For the for purpose of brevity here, I've only on these slides as a general rule shown the changes. So yeah. just as in NEC three and four, it's the same basic principle. Okay. Will the slides be made available after the presentation? Yes, yes. along with answers to any questions that we haven't managed to get through. Uh, does the introduction of a deeming provision in respect of the submitted program not unduly place the project manager and employer at risk? What was the rationale in introducing Ooh, this? Oh, good question. Provision? Does it place them at risk? What would the risk be? The, the most, as I, again, as I say in training, whilst 14.1 says that accepting anything doesn't change a contractual obligations, accepting a programme, if that programme includes employer obligations, does put the onus on the employer to do what it says on the programme. Yeah. So there is a significant reason for the project manager to look properly at the programme. That, that's not changed. Yeah. No, um, no, no apologies there. No apologies. Yeah. And because we all know that NEC doesn't work without a proper updated working program. So that's, that's really the drive behind this clause and this change. And I can only say that I've had this discussion, I don't know how many times over the last 10 years, and it's not, it's not scientific, but I would say a significant proportion of people uh, would be thinking this is a good change. Yeah. Would you agree with me? No. Uh, I, I, I don't want deemed accepted Programs no, are it's not. It's not a good sign. It's not, it's not a good sign. But uh, an accepted program is, is is you are in a better place than not having one. If you don't have one, then potentially you you are uh, left with the position that the project manager assesses all conversation. And, and then, yeah, that that course, I mean, this, this is a good, you want that again. This is a good point, and it's another one. Again, danger of going broadly off the subject here, but a lot of people miss the link between no program in place in 64.1. Yeah, yeah. As soon as a program hasn't been submitted or revised as required, under the contract, the project manager in NEC3 and NEC4 Has is to required accept. to get in and start assessing the quotations. So the way I look at clause 50.3 and 64.1, so they're two pretty nasty provisions in the contract. Yeah. We need to avoid them. Absolutely. How do we avoid them? We work together and we, we do stuff from an accepted program in place. We use it. A uh, couple more. Now, a question as such, but I can see I have a lot of teaching material to change for next September. Yeah, welcome to our world. Uh, <laughs> any period for acceptance of a quality plan? Uh, yes. Yes. That was a good enough Simple answer. answer. That's good enough. The question was yes or no. Yes or no, we'll give them a yes or no answer. Yeah, yes. it'll be a sensible period. It's probably a couple of weeks. Just a couple more, and then we'll carry on. Is it? Oh, that was, that was a big question. Too big for me. Is treated accepted program considered the same as accepted program? In cases of delays EOT evaluation, yes, will it be rejected by the PM is not officially accepted. No, oh, it no. will be it the contract be says it program. is treated, it's just the same way as a compensation event suddenly becomes accepted or uh, implemented, right? Okay. So, so, yes, okay, back to it. That's, back, back to split. That's a good idea, Rob, to give it a bit of a break. So, now we're on probably you need to take that picture out, otherwise, yeah, I can't slides. So, payment. Again, tidying up really. The project manager's still got an obligation to assess how much the contractor is due, the amount due, the 50.2, but
But now, as in PSC, there's an obligation on the contractor to actually apply for the payment and tell you how much he thinks he, sorry, uh, how much it thinks is due in the next assessment. If if the contractor does not do that, you don't get paid. Okay. Fairly fairly harsh, but in reality, again, when we talk about this in training, not many contractors don't do this anyway, so it's not going to change the world. Another yippee here. Um, the NEC3, there in. I've always said in reaction to contractors wanting to have a separate fee percentage for subcontracted workers compared with their own work, NEC introduced two, introduced two fee percentages, the direct fee percentage, subcontracted fee percentages. That causes complications in tender assessment and long and short of it, we've, we've, just, training the we've now just been the subcontracted fee percentage. So there is now just the one fee percentage which will apply to all defined cost Howsoever incurred. Okay. Howsoever. That's not an NEC sort of law. Not it? Sort of oh, sorry, Rob. I don't know how I don't know where that came from. Um, okay, some really good things I think on defined cost. Firstly, the the really annoying little last sentence, little last part of the definition of defined cost in NEC three, which says, Oh, by the way, we're not going to include the cost of preparing the event. That's options A and B. In options A and B, that's now gone. So the, pre the pre preparation of the conversation event is now a defined cost, but as Rob's about to remind me, we're only going to include it as something extra if it's actually if it's changed extra. the defined cost of yeah. doing the job. Yeah. And we will still, I'm afraid, we will still have the debate as to whether that compensation event changed the number of QSs required on the site to be doing their day job. That, whether that, or NEC not, doesn't, yeah. This, this change doesn't change that The effect is issue. whether or not the defined cost is affected by the conversation. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. And there's more. Just, just one Go more. On. Does, does the introduction, one more question, which is quite funny. Does the introduction of NEC4 mean that Richard Patterson will at last, after 12 years, get rid of his dog-eared, scruffy copy of the ECC? Oh, I love that, Ian. Ian, my hero. So the answer is... It's, no. come, all the way the from, answer's that, it's come all the way from Inverness, that is. Yeah, Do you know... It's still there by my side. eBay? No, no, I, no eBay. I can't. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a very, it's a very Simon's personal thing. But Ian, yes, I will have to start with NEC4 now. Okay, okay. thank you for that one, Rob. <laughs> what are you guys like, honestly? It's Let's be a serious, serious webinar. Serious webinar this. Come on. Wait, don't tell Rekki it's going like this, will you? Whatever you do. So final assessment. Um, this is another response to criticism by some writers, contractual writers, and the market. Um, in the NEC 3, as we know now, there is just an obligation for the PM to make another assessment after the defect certificate. It's just the last one that's explicit in the contract. Now we have a, a whole clause, quite a lot of words actually. Um, within four weeks of the defect certificate, the PM is required to make the final assessment. If the PM never gets round to it, the contractor has the opportunity to do so. Once again, I don't think it says so, but it might be a good idea if they talk to each other at this point. That'd be yeah. good, wouldn't it, Rob? Yeah. Talking to each other. Brilliant. And then we have a very un-NEC phrase, conclusive evidence, sticks out like a sore thumb, to be honest, um, of the final amount due. In other words, it's not going to go anywhere. That's it, finished. You yeah. can all go home. But unless, dot, 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 wait for it, um, if we're under W1 or W2, um, the two existing dispute resolution mechanisms, then that final assessment, so-called final assessment, may be referred by either parties up to the senior representatives. They've then got four weeks to try and sort it out. If they can't sort it within four, then it automatically, I think, goes up uh, off to the adjudicator. Okay, there's going to have to be a notice, but that's what the contract says. Well, we've got four weeks. We need clear timescales. We can't have this thing festering for years. That's the whole point. And if the adjudicator doesn't come up with an answer that both sides are happy with, then on to the tribunal. The only thing that is wrong in what I've said, again, is that that senior representative step, I'm pretty sure, no, I'm very sure, is by agreement between the parties if you're on the W2 yeah. because of the Housing Grants Act the Hugh Grant Act, as I love to call it, mm -hmm. which says we can go to uh, disputes and adjudication at any time. The only difference really with W3 is that we don't have, or it's been deemed not to need that senior representative's decision. We'll just go straight 
to the dispute avoidance board that we were talking about a moment ago. Then, there is uh, there's something isn't there about closing down defined costs as well that I haven't mentioned here, but there is a process whereby you you're totally right, and that's the, that's in, in a similar fashion to sort of no no down. I, I'm I don't know where that went, Rob. That really should be in this presentation. But it, it went isn't. into option C through to F, but that's, that's where it is in the contract. Okay, no, sorry, in the contract. In the presentation, I, I, it's your presentation. I'm very I'm, I, okay. So Rob is appropriately telling me I've missed one out. And I don't know how that got missed out, because that is actually very significant. It's in a similar vein, though. Isn't it? Similar vein, but one of the problems with NEC 3 at the moment is that the PM can correct a previous assessment in the next one at any time. There's no constraints on how far they can go back. What the NEC 3 does now is say that for, well done, good spot. What NEC 4 does now is say that the contractor may come to the, to the project manager with a chunk of defined cost of course, including if there is any disallowed cost, and say, look, that's it. This is the record, that's it. Yeah. And ticking, then basically. the clock's ticking, yeah. and the PM has quite a long period, a 13-week period, yeah. to say, yes, okay, move on. And then we're not going to go back. Yeah. So it's only relevant on a significantly long contract period, really, but it, it makes an awful lot of sense. Probably more appropriate for uh, things like the term service contract, if you're using that first. Yeah. A ten-year contract, quite possibly. Yeah. Theoretically, in year ten, you yeah. say, "Oh, just realize. no." But we, we we have. There's been stuff in the press, hasn't there, about uh, problems where uh, project managers have gone by, gone back fairly enthusiastically, looking for yeah. disallowed costs yeah. way beyond. I mean, that was that yeah. root cause of the first ever bit of case yeah. law on the contract. So, well, I'm, what are we asking? That people do the job that they should be doing at the time. That defined costs is correctly recorded and captured. Yeah, project manager. Audits the accounts yeah. records in the time. All, all of that, good practice. all of that is good, good practice. practice, and that process is not changed. Yeah. The only additional change, and apologies for not putting it on the slides, we'll put it in before we send it out. Actually, is the fact that there's a a a small addition um, of that provision that we've talked about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well spotted, Rob. Thank you. Chunk, you, could have, chunk, you, could have, you could have done that in the dry run, though, Rob, to be honest. By the way, chunk is not an NEC word. You Listen, know. I use lots of words that might not come into NEC words. So, options A and B now. This is the bit to make the QSs really happy. Any QSs out there? No, don't answer that one. Um, firstly, the shorter schedule of cost components has just lost the ER, because it's only the, the important thing is now we've only got one schedule in A and B. And you'll see in a minute, we've only got one schedule in CDEF, CDE, sorry. So we have a short schedule. <clears throat> Remember, this is only, this is nothing changed, it's still only used for assessing compensation events. And whereas today you have to go and work out how much the contractor has actually paid his steel fixer, it's in NEC 4, it's gonna, this is quite interesting. Rob keeps doing this, but <laughs> as an industry, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Which is wrong. Which is wrong, but, it, but we're starting that process. Well, okay. You promise? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, whereas, as I was saying, whereas today under option A, even though it's only for compensation events, you've still got to come up and the contractor's going to show you exactly how much wages he paid his steel fixer for that half hour of steel fixing. In NEC 4, there's the opportunity to tender rates in, in part one of the schedule of, cost, of, the shed, of the, what's now the short schedule. So we have tendered rates for different types of people, different types of skills. So the contractor and project manager are obliged to use. They're obliged to use those. Like tendered yeah. rates. There's also a mechanism to agree rates that aren't already there, yeah. which makes sense. Okay. So it's a um, bit snappier. It's, it's a bit snappier. Wanted, it's quickier. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of you out there, I'm sure, with grey hair like myself, will say, "Oh, look, it's like day works from 20 years ago," and it is. But that's, I think, is a good idea. A lesser value for option yeah. A and B. Yeah. Um, a real big change, again, if you're a bit of an NEC specialist, is that the training course on defined costs is now reduced from three quarters of a day to half a day, because we don't have to talk about the percentage for people overheads because it's not there anymore. We're saying that all those supplies, equipment and so on for sanitation and recreation and all the other bits and bobs, yeah, so various components. Uh, all those bits are now just going to be paid mostly as equipment and we'll just get paid on invoice. So that's just what's been done. Um, also a massive improvement, under the current NEC3 option A, you don't actually pay the invoice or the, or the forecast invoice to a subcontractor, 
you've got to drill down into the subcontractor's real costs. Yeah. And that never really works, to be honest. Happen. It doesn't happen. People do deals, so why don't make it more, more simple? So now we will include subcontractor amounts, which is more the same. Alignment with the more alignment component. with the schedule of cost components in option C, D, and E. And also, small detail, but in six and seven, design and manufacture, there's no overhead percentage on top of the rates. That there never should have been in the first place because there's no need and didn't add anything. It was just an added complication for no good reason. Okay, so new rules for the project managers to get their heads down, <coughs> but not earth nothing, shattering. Nothing, nothing earth shattering, but it, it, it does change the cost stuff. Yeah. So it's mostly going to affect the commercial people who may be the PM or maybe the backup team yeah. to the PM and of course the contractor on, on the other side. Option C and D, very similar and also good news. Firstly, the slightly crazy idea of having the option of using a shorter schedule to assess compensation events. No, bin, we'll just have the one schedule of cost components. Nice and clear. Clear, simple, yeah. tender evaluation, 10 times easier. And in a similar vein, we've lost the people overhead percentage in A and B, and we've lost the working area overhead percentage in C, D, and E. With those things distributed back Again, those things are now just back into cost. So you mostly will be equipment or yeah. invoice or, or, or sorry, or plant. 95% is going to be equipment, isn't it? Because it's very little that there's ever plant materials. So we'll just pay for it. Now, I can see some of you jump Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Rob. Fair enough. Um, we still pay subcontractors. The only difference is that for consistency across the patch, that statement is now made in the schedule of cost components rather than the definition defined cost. That's a detail. Okay. Tidier. So it's tidier. Tidier, it's neater, and it makes One sense. Have your hunting so much. Yeah. And similarly, the overhead percentage have gone in design and manufacture exactly the same as with options A and B. Okay. So that picture, I'm going to to hold that thought. <laughs> so now these are supplied by the contractors. We've got a nice shiny orange hat, calculator, set of glasses, pencil, and a measuring tape. Mm. Do you pay for those then as a project manager? Well, that is going to be the issue, because according to the contract, NEC4 will pay what it costs. These things are all equipment now. So they're all equipment. So they're all stuff bought to help provide the works, so they all get paid. So so one problem gets solved, but another one, smaller one, raises its head, because I mean, now we have okay, things yeah. like re residual value arguments. What, what we haven't talked about, but those in the know out there will know why this has been changed, because we had so many, so much hassle taking out yeah, the cost those of those things. things from the routine yeah. stream of cost yeah. because they were covered by the percentage. Yeah. So that's helped in, in the case of the defined cost for the routine payment. It's slightly hindered. But it has two issues. Yeah. We will have some problems inevitably on sorting out how to pay for those things. Yeah. Um, you know, the other example is, you know, the, the site agents come into the office with his old laptop. I'll leave it there. And it also means when we're pricing up compensation events, if there is a, a an extension to the complete, if there is more time on site, there is going to be more toilet paper used. Therefore, yeah. the parties, sorry, the project manager contractor are going to have to include that in an assessment. And they haven't got a, a nice percentage to apply now. But in the scheme of things, in the scheme of say things, the working area overhead percentage was 10% of the people costs. And the people cost is a percentage it's of the whole. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's relatively in, small numbers. I'm saying numbers. peanuts, but yeah. it's small numbers. It's small numbers. Focus on the, on the focus on the big numbers. And again, as we say forever in training, particularly option C, focus on how much money you're paying out to subbies, because that's yeah. where most of the money's going, yeah. not on the flipping toilets and toilet paper. Yeah, you didn't say flipping. Carry on. Sorry. Compensation events, number six, the last one. We're nearly there, guys and ladies. This poor Rob helps me out on that one. Firstly, a correction, in my humble opinion. You can now add in additional compensation events as a one line or as a bullet point in the contract data, in the same way that you could always add in additional employers' risks. Mm -hmm. So now there will be two bullet points, one underneath the other, so at least the person writing the contract data will be prompted to think what's the difference between these two. Yeah. And we don't have to go to a Z clause to add in a compensation event for a certain flood event, for example. Um, a nice tidying up, I think it's very good tidying up actually, is that we have a separate clause now in section six for the whole concept of a, of a sorry, a quotation for a proposed instruction. It's nice and tidy. All tidy. Yeah. Um, and also, um, there has been a problem whereby contractors were asked to provide quotations for these 
possible compensation events. And in some cases, oh, that's always going to take time. In some cases, well, particularly if there was some design involved, yeah, if, you're involved do, if you're going to do it professionally, Very expensive, you're going to yeah. have to spend some design. Yeah. And then the client says, oh, yeah, too much, not going to bother. Yeah. And you've just wasted, put a whole load of money into the ground. And option A contract in particular, or option B, uh, yeah. is a, a left of mass attention. Indeed. It's, it's, not, it's never been a clause that, that fitted with the collaborative yeah, working that, that, that we're talking about. Okay. So that is a, a, a good, I think, a very positive thing. Okay. And then probably lastly, um, and this is just a tidying thing, in 63.1, we have a clause which tells us when's the difference between actual defined cost and when we start forecasting. It's, well, it's the date that the PM notified instruction or that the contractor notified the conversation event, roughly. Don't quote me on that, read the contract. All we've done now is give, a, give it a name. It's a lowercase name, but it's the dividing it's date. Term. So there's clarity that that's the dividing date we use when it comes to that cost overall cost submission. Likewise, we take our, we use our program that was current at the dividing date yeah. to work out the, so the accepted program current the dividing date, as it says. Switch date is another term I've heard, but they've called yeah, it dividing date. Yeah, I've okay. heard, I've seen people use switch date in publications, but we've called it dividing date. Okay. So again, in that whole page there, there's nothing radical. It's not, affect the project manager. The, the only thing that, well, okay, the only thing is, is that the PM is going to have to sort out quotations and conversation events for proposed conversation events which yeah. can go ahead. Yeah. But again, grown up people on site will just make sure they've got a, a clear, um, firstly, a cost recording system for the people booking time to prepare in that quotation. Although, as we said, Robert, it doesn't change the fact you've still got to, there still will the be a debate as to whether it's yeah. actually increased the overall defined cost. Okay. Um, so, in terms of those one to six and the detail, apart from me missing out on the defined cost finalisation, for which I humbly apologise, that's pretty much where we are. I don't know where we are in terms of time. I'm going to ask you some, some questions. No, that, that's it, isn't it? Are you that, that, that? That, that's, that's it. it. That's okay. it. That's where we've come to. So, in the next seven minutes or so, let's see what other questions we've, uh, we've got. Uh, no. How to use BIM with NC4? Question mark. Okay, that that's that as you probably would guess is. Oh, there won't be a how to use. There won't there won't be a how to use okay. guide. That will go into guidance, won't it? So yeah, BIM is now in. Do you like in? Anybody like in? I'm not no, sure no, about that, Rob. But BIM is now in, and there won't be a how to guide. There'll be guidance. There'll be within the general guidance. Respective uh, contracts as to how to implement the uh, information uh, model. Um, right. So how does X12 fit with alliancing? Should it be used? For alliancing, um, that's quite interesting. There will be an alliancing contracts. Yeah, which we, be, we didn't mention, but there are two for consultation yeah. it, in uh, in June. Um, the, the the big difference is that the alliancing will be a everybody signing up to the same contract document. Yeah. Whereas X12, with its new name of multi-party collaboration, is still going to be the same principle, which is a set of bi-party contracts yeah. with an X12 stitching them together. Yeah. And I'm. I've not been involved in the drafting of the alliancing contract, but I'm pretty sure there won't be any um, additional need for the next 12 to go with it. But alliancing is interesting, isn't it? You can you can have so many opinions or discussions yeah. about what it means. What so, to, to me, X12 will, will help you um, realise some of the principles and values of alliancing without formalising the alliancing yeah. contract itself. So, the alliancing contract will allow for multiple parties to sign up to the same terms of I, I would certainly think that X12 will be simpler. Having said that, X12 is, can be as complicated as you want to make it, basically. Quickly, a couple more that. then, Richard. Question: sure. Why would the contractor not get 100% of the saving, reduction in cost and no target change, if it was their idea? Uh, good question. Um, because we are trying to encourage some collaboration, we're probably wanting the employer to work with the contractor with his idea, I'm guessing. Um, again, if you want to give the contractor 100% of the saving, you that's do. your choice. You Just do. put it in the contract data. To be honest, you're dictating that because you will put in the value engineering percentage yeah. that you wish the contractor to yeah, get and, people out the benefits and, of. And I haven't actually even baked it, got my head around to think, and there's probably an article in, in, in deciding what's a good number. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Yeah. A uh, couple more then. So, uh, 
Oh, okay. Accreditation. <laughs> Will ECC project manager accreditation courses change too? Yes. Um, Will the NEC3 ECC project manager accreditation course lose some value? No. Next question. No, it won't um, lose value. Come on, Robbie. A little bit more help. Of course. Though. The, the, the two have to run in parallel, won't they? There'll be accreditation of the project manager, supervisor, to, um, service manager that will run in parallel. So for three and four. I would imagine they're working on a, a transition between one to two. I don't think it's abandon all your knowledge and start from scratch. There'll be a, yeah, they're, they're, a transition. They're, they're, it's I'm it's, sure it's, transition be, it's being worked on here at uh, NECHQ. There will be a, an appropriate top up from any those that you uh, out there that are, have done the accredited project manager and got through your seventy percent pass mark. Firstly, well okay. done. Secondly, there will be a top up to get you to the yeah. SE4 status. Last one. So I'm, I'm the quiz master general. Free issue items supplied by the client. How is that managed? Put it in the scope. It's not changed at all on the SE4, which is why I had to mention. Put it on the program. Make Put it sure on the it scope. Happens. Tell them when you're going to provide it or make it available. Talk to each other about it. And if you don't, if as an employee you don't do what you said you're going to do, there's going to be a compensation. Then. It's yeah. fairly straightforward. Yeah. Okay. So apologies, we didn't um, answer all the questions. Uh, we will do so, a few more uh, things in wrap up. We've got four minutes, have So the NEC annual, the NEC users group annual seminar 2017 is the 22nd of June. It's at County Hall, London, to accommodate more people than would usually be the case. Why? Because uh, the launch of NEC four uh, will be made that day. And it's creating launch. a little bit of interest as you'll be. Yeah, doing. a lot of interest. You can contact us. Anything else that you would like? Information on the NEC users group, uh, information on contracts, on accreditation, on training, on all sorts of NEC things. There's the contact details. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this this webinar and you'll tell people to watch this because it was really quite fun, wasn't it? Well, I've enjoyed it. And it'll be uh, available very shortly on YouTube and other such channels. We still have 699 of the original. It's still, it's still hanging on in there. 83. Yeah, so, so bless you all. Thank you for attending. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons and goodbye. Thank you very much. Cheers.